Hello, welcome to the second talk in the le lecture hall. We now have Axel Arnold from Billiger.de, which is Germany's largest price comparison platform. And he's going to show us, give us a real world business case how they are using Redis, Ele Elasticsearch, and Python at Billiger.de. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and uh, thank you for attending my uh, presentation. Um, yeah, so what I want to talk to you about is how we basically process data, or more precisely, how we process offers uh, for our price comparison site, uh, Billiger.de. And, uh, well, just to spoil already why we have that strange uh, typo there at, the, uh, there at the end, well, that's simply our internal uh, shortcut for the Elasticsearch server because, well, Elsa is much shorter than Elasticsearch. And if you have to talk continuously about the server, that's uh, our Elsa. Um, first, a bit about the company. The company behind Billiger.de is actually um, Sruti GmbH, which is located uh, first a bit uh, north or west from here. Um, we have about 300 employees, uh, mostly located here in Karlsruhe. There's uh, smaller offices in Leipzig and Dresden, and we have one office in uh, Plovdiv in Bulgaria. Um, as I said already, our main business is the price comparison site Billiger.de. We have about like 200 visit, uh, 200,000 uh, visitors per day. Um, from the data, we have about 65 million offers. They are currently ramping up because we are already approaching uh, Christmas. Um, so we have about 65 million offers, about 50,000 dealers, and 2,500 uh, 2, data feeds. There's quite a number of marketplaces, as you can see. Um, what we do is then we cluster those uh, offers into uh, products. That's about 50 million. The reason that there's actually not that much fewer offers, uh, that much fewer products and offers is simply because we have quite a lot of uh, fashion where basically offer equals product. Um, what's the volatility uh, that we have? That's about six million offers per day or eight million products that we have to recompute uh, per day. So there's a bit of uh, processing that we actually need to do. Um, we actually have a second uh, business running on top of that. That's um, the syndication, which basically means we uh, provide product information, offers, and search for other uh, companies like for T-Online, GameStar, and so forth. Okay, so that's uh, what we do. How we do that? Well, uh, Salute is a Python company. With a very, 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 very few exceptions, all the code that we write is in Python. Um, we are running on Debian systems, so it's everything is uh, the, the production systems are all Linux and also actually our developer machines. <coughs> also, yeah. Um, deployment is done via Puppet. Uh, we have still a few Postgres uh, databases, but we are gradually moving away to more uh, scalable storages like either uh, Elasticsearch or Redis. And our search is powered by uh, Solar. If you want to hear more about that, there will actually be talk uh, tomorrow by Patrick Schemitz about our search, and that's done by Solar. Okay, so we want to do price comparison. So what actually do we need to do with the data? Well, that's actually a reasonably recent uh, screenshot. Um, we want to um, give you the opportunity to compare prices for um, that phone in that case. Um, so what do we need? Well, we of course need the offers that we get from the shops right away. But we also need properties and images um, for the product that we actually want you to buy from one of those uh, shops, right? So like display size. Um, we actually have only one picture because at that time the iPhone was still fairly new, right? Okay, so that's the thing that we need to do. Now, where do we get that from? Um, in principle, it looks very simple, just with a lot of data. Um, the shops provide us with uh, data feeds uh, for the offers. So um, we are not doing any scraping. All the offers that you see on uh, Billig.de actually come in through data feeds, uh, data feeds uh, from the shops. Um, and then we have a process that's called mapping and matching, which is actually doing the categorization and the clustering of those uh, offers. 
And once we have clustered them, this is, uh, well, the basically the product seeds. What we now need to do is those clusters that we have identified as belonging to the same offer, uh, to the same uh, product, we need to enrich those products with, as you have seen, with, with, by calculating the properties of this product, like display, de uh, display size and uh, memory and whatever, um, finding out what are the nicest pictures to show you, and in, in some cases we get from third parties also test reports, which we then add to the product. And then we have to store all of this um, by category in, uh, for further down processing, basically for putting it into the search and the uh, front end service, which is uh, then not what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, how do we do that? And that's actually um, the core of the whole infrastructure behind it. We have workers that, do, uh, that process all these changes to offers on, uh, uh, based on events. So you could call it microservices, we call it workers. Um, the process is actually, in principle, very simple. Um, we have bulk imports that take these uh, data feeds that we get from the shop, import them in our document store, which is called the tank, and is actually a sharded redis by now. That's the one that we want to migrate away from. Um, on top of this sharded redis, we have workers that uh, use, again, redis-based queues to uh, decide what they uh, do. Now, what do the workers actually do? Basically, all the queues tell them something got uh, changed. That is uh, typically a document. There's some change to a document. Because of that, you need to recompute something else, like a product. Um, we change things to the, pro uh, to the uh, documents. And uh, actually, those workers, um, they don't really process tiny events, but they typically process small batches between 1 and 200 events. The nice thing about this architecture is that Essentially, it scales trivially. So if we need more computational power, we can just add more servers with more workers, instances on them, because everything is, there's at least, of every worker, four instances. The, the, the most work-intensive things have like 120 workers, and uh, you can add on demand. The queues are very um, simple. I will talk about it a bit later, but what they do is they store just IDs of things that have uh, gotten dirty, that have been changed, typically documents or products. Um, because we only store the fact that something has changed, uh, our queues actually deduplicate, so we, don't, we never need to process something twice uh, if we didn't manage to process it in once. Of course, if it changes later again, if we already process it, we have to do it again. And so essentially our queues do the only thing is um, prioritizing what we have to do. Okay, so how does the uh, event flow look like? Um, that's a bit simplified. There's actually a few more things going on that we need for, for, uh, for other processes. But essentially, there's two pipelines that um, are triggered when the document changes. So these uh, blue boxes uh, mark queues that we have. So we have a queue that says, okay, some document changed. Then there's one track that basically fetches the URLs that are stored with the document because we need to download the pictures. That's actually done by the fetching process, so it finds out, ah, there's a new URL that you have to look after and stores it in our CDN. It does also something else. It re remembers that after cache expiry or after a certain amount of time, essentially, we need to look at the picture again because it might have changed on the server. So that's what the server does, and then it stores it in our binary store, which is actually a module at the end of the day. The second track is the matcher track. So when the document has changed, uh, we need to basically figure out how much did it change. Maybe we need to now say, okay, it's actually a different offer because it might have happened that it's changed. So we need to figure out what category and what product it actually belongs to. So we put it to our matcher. Um, and if the matcher then says, yes, I figured out that there's something new about it, we have the classifier which takes actually um, additional information from the document and basically computes what's the effective product that we assign this offer to. So we get a certain offer or uh, information about a product, and yeah, we need to figure out what product uh, come to, and both queues then end up in saying if they <coughs> happened to uh, figure out that some URL changed or that uh, the classification or whatever changed, then we have a change on a product. And then we have one process, that's the assembler, that's the most work-intensive one, which actually at, under the hood also uses 
Siphon for exactly that reason because it's pretty uh, computationally uh, intensive and computes the actual properties for the product and stores it in our product index, which is an, is an elastic search index in that case. And the queues basically solve most of the uh, wiring pros problems that you have on a very simple basis. So we, we can join different events just by putting them in the same queue and we can handle recurring events and that's basically all the things that we need. So how do these queues work? And that's the part where I said we are mostly a Python company. Um, the queues are actually uh, implemented by using Redis sorted sets. Now Redis is a pretty fast in-memory uh, key value store, um, but it's not really a queuing system, but you can implement one on top of Redis very simply if you add one little additional function to the server itself, and that you do in providing Lua code to the server. So we have about 30 lines of uh, Lua code involved in that. The rest is Python or Siphon. Um, basically, for the worker, it looks very simple. The worker claims a certain batch of items. I said we have between 1 and 200 uh, items in size for, the, for this batch. So it, it, it gets a certain items that is processing next. Then it does some processing. Maybe in between, it actually tells another queue that I have changed something there, or I will be changing something there shortly. Um, and eventually, the items that it claimed, it finishes. So from the Redis point of view, the only, as I said, interesting part is the claiming of the item because it actually means that, the, um, that we start a small Lua code inside the uh, Redis, which means that it's an atomic operation in terms of, of, uh, of the viewpoint of the uh, Redis. Um, it first checks actually whether there's claimed items for this worker still there. If that is so, it will immediately get those items again. In other words, as long as the worker didn't finish with the last work bunch, it will have to do it again and again and again and again until it finally manages to process those things that have been assigned to it. If not, we take new things from the uh, event item set, delete them from the queue because they have been now assigned to a worker and process them. Okay, and the rest of the operations are very easy because if you want to enqueue something, well, we add it to this uh, sorted that set that we used to uh, represent the uh, queue. And if we want to finish it, we just need to delete the item from the uh, uh, worker's claimed items until the claimed items are uh, empty. So that's basically how the whole queuing is built. Pretty simple. And by that, fairly robust. Now, how do we uh, talk actually to the uh, sharded Redis that is behind as a data store? Um, Basically, there's a Python Redis driver that you can use and that, provide, uh, that, that, uh, that features um, proxy values, um, which you can use to, uh, um, uh, to, to represent values in Redis and just interact with them as they were uh, locally on your machine. Um, Redis itself is not transactional if you don't do special tricks like we, as I said before with, um, storing, with stored procedures essentially in, the, in, in, in Redis itself. However, we can very simply with our queues emulate uh, transactionality because actually for every property of such of a uh, data access object, there's only one queue responsible for changing this part. And because the queues are deduplicating, there's never two workers working on the same pro property um, of, uh, of a queue, uh, of, of a uh, data access object. Okay, another thing I said that workers may uh, issue new events. That's not entirely true. In fact, the, this, the data access objects do that uh, because that minimizes the chance that we actually forget to implement one, uh, the, the, uh, this change events. And finally, we need to make sure that we, because the events and the data are stored in different registers, we make, need to minimize the uh, chance of uh, basically issuing an event without actually changing anything or vice versa. And that you can actually get fairly easily by uh, using Redis pipelines for both queues and writing things simultaneously. In Python, that looks very simple. That's, uh, of course, still simplified, but we have essentially these, uh, uh, these uh, objects that represent the uh, uh, property uh, from Redis, 
we can read them out just by getting the data by uh, classic the Python properties. And if we set them, we actually just check, for example, if something changed, we put it into the queue and tell them here, I, I just dirtied the meta information of that object, which in that case, meta means that's the URLs. Um, we need to fetch things there and we change the data. Okay, so that's very simple. Now, why, if everything works so great, we actually want to get away from the sharded redis? Well, yes, it's a very fast um, storage. However, we have currently 16 servers with 144 gigabytes RAM each. And yet, because we need redundancy, because you actually can't use all of the RAM of a Redis instance, in fact, we have less than one terabyte of uh, total storage that, we, that is usable. Um, right now, 80% of that is filled. And it will take about one year until we have 100%. And that means we are breaking down. Um, we can't simply increase that because we are actually using a fixed 8-server uh, hash routing and then redundancy makes 16 servers, right? Uh, so we can't just add more servers. We can't add more RAM to the servers in, in, in operation that easily. Um, so, hmm. and actually, the other disadvantage of the whole thing is that uh, the product lookup is the thing that you need to do most because we basically say a product has changed, now I need to get all the documents. Um, we had to implement ourselves. Um, What's the performance about this is about, we can read about 200 documents per second per, on a single thread, write about 160 documents, and get documents for about 12 products per second. Um, if you calculate it for a day, we can do about 80 million document changes per day. That's fine because we have only about 6 million, as I said before. In principle, we can process the whole data store in one day. That's great. However, 12 products per second makes about 8 million uh, product changes per day, and that's pretty much the baseline that we currently need. Okay, so can we do better? Um, actually, we introduced Elasticsearch before, um, simply for the reason that uh, we needed to search our data, which you really can't do with the Redis. So we put an Elasticsearch on top of the Redis. Um, it uh, currently has a four terabyte of storage available, which is less than 20% filled right now, because we can calculate it back from the numbers before. Um, it would automatically rebalance if we would need to add more um, space to that. And it actually does all this searching for us, which essentially means also the reverse lookup for products. Now, if it does everything so great, um, but there must be a penalty in performance. Uh, actually, not really. Currently, we can read with our system about 1,200 documents per second and write 200. So we have the same write performance as with Redis before, which is clear because we need to do all the search indices but we can read already four times as much. But much more important, we can read about 450 products per second if we do a bit of clever bulk operations. Though that's 40 times as much as we can get out of our old Redis-based system. So that means that by, by moving to, to Elasticsearch, we can actually get way more uh, storage. At the same time, it gets scalable and it's faster. How do access look, data access objects look like here? Well, it's exactly the same as before. That's why most of the text is the same. The difference is that uh, because Redis really doesn't, uh, uh, Elasticsearch really doesn't like small updates, what we do is basically uh, the uh, Elasticsearch store acts like it would be a JSON document, and you can update this document so that you have changed several keys at once because it's just. That's the only difference that we have to before. Now, one of the smaller downsides is actually, and that I want to uh, just warn everybody about here, is um, the driver side. With Redis, I said there's one Python driver, which is uh, quite uh, great. But uh, for Elasticsearch, well, there is an official driver, but it's really, really close to the REST API. And with really close, I mean something like that. Look. There is a comma separated string that you have to give in as a parameter. What you actually get out is a new line separated uh, string. Hmm. OK, so that doesn't look really that Pythonic. Um, there's also some inconsistencies here. Yeah. So it doesn't look like that Pythonic. So you probably start Googling for, hey, is there a Pythonic driver for, for Elasticsearch? And then you find out, yes, there's PyES or PyElasticSearch. Um, we tried all of those. Um, the problem is they are hopelessly outdated. So Redis, uh, Elasticsearch is right now at version 5. 
version 6 is creeping up, and those drivers are at 1.4 and 0.99. So we tried all three of those drivers. We can't really try to get rid of them. Please just use the official driver, the other ones. Um, it, they have a very bad track record. Okay. So I told you, I will tell you about the migration. It's every, actually, with the system that we have, uh, just all the, um, all the mechanics that I have put in place before is everything we need to do the migration. Um, we add one additional worker, this reformatted index worker, that just checks any changes on the old uh, Charlotte Redis and indexes it to our new Elasticsearch store, which we call the L-Store. Um, on top of this, uh, we can just build our new infrastructure. So the first thing we do is we move the assembler from the old sharded redis to the L-Store. Then basically all the output is already coming from here. And now we can start readily just moving workers that had been working previously on that data store uh, onto the new data store. Um, that's what we are currently doing. At the moment, we basically have both running at the same time and about, well, the Thatcher line is actually already moved to the new store. The matching line is still working on the other store and we gradually move everything over and we should be finished um, actually somewhere before end of this year. Okay, so we basically just move everything over and at the end there's just no one writing to the Redis and we can just switch it off. As easy as that. Okay, with that and then the, at the end, so what I uh, showed you is basically how we process in more or less real time about 50 million data product sheets for our website and for the authentication services just using Python workers and uh, Redis priority queues and uh, how we can actually because of that simple structure easily migrate from sharded Redis to Elasticsearch as the core store for our uh, data without any downtime in between and yeah it's all written in Python and with that I am uh, done and uh, thank you for your attention and once more I want to actually uh, advertise um, the uh, talk tomorrow by uh, Patrick Schemitz if you're interested in how our search works and we have a small booth out there if you're interested in what we're doing else. Thank you. So the question is whether we uh, were thinking about writing our own driver. So far, uh, not really. Uh, the reason is that uh, Elasticsearch still is moving very fast. And um, well, actually, you get used to the interface. And because, in fact, in fact, if you s look at it, the one that doesn't look um, for those that know Elasticsearch, that's actually the interface with which you can figure out what shards are stored on your server. So this is already far down in what you need for, for, for your workers. The workers that we write actually only use the um, bulk uh, helper. So there's basically helper functions for doing bulk access to the server. And that one is reasonably Pythonic. It's not great, but it uh, works. And that's why actually, yeah, so far... We stick with it. So uh, the, the question is that we, that we uh, well that there's uh, a chance of data loss when you get network uh, hangups uh, with Elasticsearch. So the first thing is, it's not entirely true that this is the only data store because you have to remember we do um, at the very beginning we do those bulk feed imports that where we actually get the feed data from. These are stored on our module as well. So we have a second store where we have basically the raw data. And if we would pump that into the system, it would take less than a day to actually uh, basically recompute everything. It would probably cost a lot of energy, but it uh, would be possible in principle. The second thing is that um, 
an Elasticsearch, basically a network split up in our setup is extremely unlikely because we have only six data nodes. So if you have an Elasticsearch instance with a couple of thousand instances, then probably yes, you have to think about a network splits. But if we get a network split in our setup, then we definitely have other problems before, the, before actually we have to care about Elasticsearch because then our front ends would also just not work anymore. So no, no, we never have, uh, we actually never had problems with that. And uh, it also the reports are actually quite old because the um, current Elasticsearch version actually um, also stores the uh, transaction log pretty aggressively to disk, so the chance is quite unlikely. Yeah, so the question is basically, um, we, uh, we are now basically moving the basic storage from, uh, from, from Redis to Elasticsearch, but we also use Redis for the queuing, and that we will actually uh, keep for a while. No, you couldn't do uh, the queuing with Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch is only eventually correct and all these uh, problems. Um, we could eventually think about, we were thinking about moving it to Kafka, but right now we don't really see uh, a good point to do so because um, the, the queues on top of Redis are fairly robust. And in fact, um, we don't really, uh, there, there, there's no, no good chance that we run into memory problems on, on, on the queuing size because if our size, uh, queues grow about the size of memory that we can put into the server, then again, we have other, other problems because it means that we just can't cope with the workload. Um, and then we can, of course, increase the memory, but we will just build up more and more backlog until we, uh, we're done. So. We, in any ways, need to solve that problem on a different level. There was another question from Ethan. Hmm. Uh, I have a question. You use the Elasticsearch to work up memory and the audio of documents. So, which tool do you use it to visualize the data when you have the green cell after you categorize the documents? Okay, so the. the Sorry, this is my question, not so much related to your question. Yeah, the. the, um, okay, the thing. The question is essentially how we visualize the data that we have in Elasticsearch. On, in, in short, we basically don't visualize it because it's, uh, it's a big bunch of, of product uh, data. So it's not really uh, that it's... Um, there might be some interest in future in actually uh, getting... Uh, it would be great if we would finally do some, uh, some, some BI on the data that we have. Right now we have a separate uh, people that are just building up a BI uh, system for us and we are not using the information here. Internally, we, we, we do use um, plain, plain Elasticsearch queries to get out a certain well, information about like how many pictures we can't actually fetch from a certain shop and these kind of things. But this is still all in Python at the end of the day. Uh, can you hear about the feedback? Yes. Yeah, the, the thing is that uh, we actually do have Kibanas for um, looking at uh, log information from other systems. Uh, putting a Kibana in front of um, the document store here, um, well, it's, it's about 80 million records that quite continuously change and they actually are not small records. So they have about like uh, 200 to 400 keys and uh, we tried it and we switched it quickly off because it didn't really uh, perform well. I mean, it just it's too much data for that. So the question is, if a worker fails, how we get it back into the queue? Um, the short answer is, it doesn't get back into the queue. It, it stays assigned to that worker. So the, once a worker got this workload, if the worker fails, the worker will restart and will get essentially the same bunch of work again. That means, for example, that um, if, so if the failure is just due to some network hiccup or whatever, it doesn't matter. If it's because I made a mistake and the code just can't, it just doesn't work, then I should better code quickly fast because uh, of course we, we have to fix the problem because in fact also putting it back to the queue wouldn't help it, right? We, there's actually some tooling that if we know that a worker will permanently stay away because for example we realized that we added like 
200 workers to do something and then 199 of those are idle, then of course we reduce the number of workers for a certain task and then there's actually tooling to put things manually back to the queue. But normally, work once it was assigned to a worker, that worker has to cope with the work and in the worst case, uh, we need to quickly uh, fix whatever we broke. Uh, but in fact, last time we had it, we, when we moved the uh, fetcher queue over to the new system, it was like three or four times that we need to do uh, to fix something up that we just, because essentially the old code was one of this very nice try, except anything, just, just remark that we, we, we didn't cope with it and we said, well, maybe we want to know what actually happens there. And we figure out there's actually very few exceptions that only ever drop there. And uh, so we had like two, three times to fix things. But essentially that's how we work. Yes, uh, it, it's it's the the point is that it's removed. Um, oh, oh, I have the. Yeah. So the, the 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 simple trick is that we actually remove. The, so we first we do it in one uh, uh, transaction on the on the Redis server side, so we can show that all these things that you, that you basically see here, left of the uh, uh, right of the uh, sorry, those will happen all or nothing. So we basically remove the items. When the worker claims those, I immediately remove them from the queue and uh, put them into a separate mini queue that is assigned to that worker. And by that we, we know that uh, no other worker can actually get them except for one small, very <laughs> unlikely problem that you can get that is if there's a very high frequency update to something, it can in theory happen that the, while the worker is still processing it, the item already gets added again to the queue because we already removed it, it's not in there anymore, and then if some worker is again fast enough to take that next item, then you get into uh, trouble. But um, there's actually, for most of these queues, they have at least a, a 60 second uh, delay before they actually process something, because we want to get these uh, batches of workload together. So typically we, we uh, basically wait a bit until we have at least a certain amount of data coming in, and basically don't see that happening. Unfortunately, we have to stop it here now. Um, thank you very much, Axel.